Give them, O Lord, inquiring and discerning hearts, the courage to will and to persevere, a spirit to know and to love you, and the gift of joy and wonder in all of your works. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. I have been looking forward to this day, and uh, I have been at the cathedral pretty much all day. I got there at 9.30 to be sure I'd get a parking place. A couple of thousand Episcopalians were coming together at the cathedral to welcome their presiding bishop. The service started at 12 noon. It ended at 3 o'clock. I was on M Street at 325. I had to be at St. James. I have not been home. I don't have my stick with me. It's at home. I didn't have time to go home. had to get here to do this wonderful confirmation. And I'm glad to be here. I have three stories. First story has to do with Father Ben and me. Some of you don't know that I've known Ben since he was about 14. And uh, for 10 years, he and I were together in Kentucky. And the last baptism I did with Ben was at the edge of the Rough River at All Saints Camp and Conference Center. A college student that was working as our summer staff counselor uh, decided that she wanted to be baptized. And a kid, that a uh, young uh, teenager from Ben's parish, also decided that it was time for him to be baptized. So the last baptism Ben and I did, he was wearing a pair of shorts and a t-shirt. I was wearing a bathing suit and a t-shirt and a little sick call stole. And I took this woman into the rough river that surrounds All Saints Camp in Litchfield, Kentucky. And I immersed her all the way down in the water. And I said, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And then standing there in the river, I sealed her, which was her confirmation since I'm a bishop and she was being baptized in the presence of the bishop. And then we baptized a young man, same thing. Ben and I, Ben helped me. They were kind of big. And we got them and we held them under the water and buried them with Jesus in his death and rose them up in the power of the Lord's resurrection. And there were about 60 senior high campers watching that happen. Now we're baptizing tonight and I've already warned at least one of our baptismal candidates that it's going, he's going to get wet. <laughs> because even though we're using this lovely Victorian bowl, the prayer book tells me as the baptizer that I should dip him in water. That's the preference. Or when you've only got a Victorian bowl, you pour water over him in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. He is being buried in Christ's death and he will be found in Christ's resurrection as was true for all of you who were baptized when you were those wonderful squiggly babies that your parents and godparents loved you enough to bring you to the waters of baptism and those waters of baptism you're claiming today. So the first story is imagine when you think of baptism as being buried in water and coming up into a whole new life. Keep that in your mind. The other story I'm going to tell you, even though I was baptized as an infant and have no memory of it whatsoever, what I do remember that always helps me understand my baptism is something that occurred in my life when I was just two years old. We were vacationing at the Gulf of Mexico in Alabama, and my dad went into the surf, and I followed him. The problem was he didn't know I was following him. And this is my earliest memory. I went deeper into the water, and all of a sudden there was no bottom and there was no top. I was tossing and turning. I remember the opaque gray. I remember no air. I remember the panic. I remember the paralyzing fear. And I remember what my dad's arms felt like when he grabbed me and he found me in that chaos and he brought me to life. The third story is about a young woman in Hungary. She's 17. She spent last year in Fairfax County at Church of the Holy Comforter in Vienna, Virginia, one of our Episcopal churches. She was a foreign exchange student living with an Episcopal family. She found faith 
true Holy Comforter Episcopal Church. She was baptized and she was confirmed and then she went back to Hungary. And she sent a video to her sponsoring family three weeks ago. And it showed her and she was at the fence at the border of Hungary with the desperate refugees. And she had boxes of Pampers and she had blankets and she had water bottles. And she was handing these supplies over the fence to the hordes of refugees that are coming to Europe because she had been baptized and she had confirmed her baptismal promises. And now girls and boys, gentlemen and ladies, I want you to look at your hands. Jesus wants your hands. Jesus wants your hands to become his hands. We heard in our Old Testament reading that the souls of the righteous are in the hands of God. You have been held gently and firmly and strongly and lovingly in the hands of God since the day of your baptism. God found you on your baptismal day the way my dad found me in the chaos of that Gulf of Mexico water. God has found you and holds you for eternity and cannot and will not let you go. God is not capable of letting you go. His hands have found you. The souls of the righteous, including all of you, are in the hands of God. That is good news. But when you know that, when you know that the same love that brought everything into being is the love that finds us and redeems us, when you know you are held by those hands, then you have no choice but to hold others. And that's what your sister in Christ, who now lives in Hungary and is back home, knows. That's why she used her hands to bring those supplies to those desperate people fleeing a chaos we can only imagine because she knows that her hands are now owned by the Lord Jesus. He has no hands but your hands, no feet but your feet, no heart but your heart. The souls of the righteous are in the hands of God and God trusts us to extend his hands to this hurting world. That was so clear in the gospel that Ben read, the raising of Lazarus. God does God's job, and that's to raise people from death to life. God found Lazarus in the tomb in the person of his son, Jesus. But do you notice the one thing Jesus did not do for Lazarus, and that was unbind him? He invited the onlookers to do the unbinding. And tonight, gentlemen and ladies, men and women, baptized intentional Christians, Jesus is saying the same thing to you that he said to those who witnessed Lazarus back from the grave. He's saying to us, unbind them. Unbind them. We are trusted with the ministry of unbinding. That is, when somebody, uh, there's a wonderful book called Waiting for Godot by Samuel Beckett, and two tramps are talking to each other, and one of the tramps says to the other tramp, who am I to tell my nightmares to if I can't tell them to you? How many of you have friends? Sometimes friends tell each other their nightmares, not just their bad dreams, but their bad reality. Sometimes when we listen to another person's truth, we are unbinding them. I hope you will listen with the ears of Jesus Christ to your friends, particularly when they share with you a problem or an issue or a nightmare. We unbind by our capacity to listen. That's what our best friends do for us. They listen to us. The girl from Hungary knew the cries of the refugees and she unbound them with her presence, with her welcome, with her care, with her compassion. That's how we unbind. That's how Jesus trusts you tonight. 
to live your baptism in such a way that people that are all bound up are made free because you're in the world, because you exist to help someone be free. That's what God is trusting you with tonight. God is the God of resurrection, but God trusts us enough to enlist us as partners in the unbinding of his world so that his creation will be free to live and to love and to be the people that God dreams them to be. So you are part of God's dream coming true in other people's lives. Can you really give your hand and your heart, your feet, and yourself to this wonderful trust of unbinding others? When you were baptized, we prayed that God would give you an inquiring and discerning heart, that God would give you the courage to will and to persevere, a spirit to know and to love God, and the gift of joy and wonder. The fact that you're here in church tonight, and for all of you parents and godparents, and friends, isn't it wonderful that God was faithful to that promise? He prayed over them on their baptismal day. Tonight is God's promise come true for these young adults. God's promise is also true for each of us, not just for those being baptized and confirmed tonight, but I want all of you to look at your hands, to wonder who God might be trusting you to unbind. Is there something unforgiven in your family that needs to be unbound by you? Is there a hungry person in Fauquier County bound by deprivations that many of us could not imagine who will be unbound by your generosity and your love? Who is God trusting you as a baptized person to unbind? Because you see, baptism and confirmation, like all Christian acts, are not spectator sports. You're going to see the waters of baptism flow over the, the bodies of two people who are making a mature adult claim of their faith. And you can't watch it without thinking about your own baptism and the way you and I are trusted with this ever-so-loved world. So don't you dare be a spectator tonight. I want you to feel the water coming over you as you see it coming over them. I want you to know that it's like I was found in those chaotic Gulf of Mexico waters, so in your baptism, you were found by arms that have found you and cannot let you go. I want you to know tonight, like you've never known it, that the souls of the righteous are in the hands of God, and they also extend the hands of God in the trust and the glory and the privilege of unbinding for the sake of Jesus Christ. Amen.